welcome you all here tonight to the meeting of the Environmental Services Committee in the, the Green Genoma. There's a hybrid meeting with some councillors in the chamber and others on WebEx. Before I go to the agenda, I'm going to bring Councillor Victor Warrington in with a, a very sad news to the rest of the chamber. Thank you, Chair, for that main. Um, well, this evening, just around uh, half five, I received a phone call from Councillor Alan Rainey. Um, unfortunately, this evening, as a result of a traffic accident on the motorway, um, Councillor Rainey's grandson was, was killed in that accident. Um, and Councillor Rainey's grandson uh, had just, that just him and his partner had a uh, a baby on Sunday, and he was going down to the hospital to lift them to bring them home. Um, so as you can imagine, it 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 was quite a difficult phone call from Councillor Rainey, um, because he'd also, uh, been involved. Uh, he had a cousin who died, uh, who he was very close with as well, who had died, and the removal of the remains was today, and he just came home from that. And there was police at the house uh, where, even though the, the grandson didn't live at the house, his son was there and the, the, the police was there when he got home. So uh, I think it's important to remember Councillor Rainey at this time um, because he's obviously, he was quite distraught when I was talking to him, understandably so. So thank you for letting me in, Chair, to give you that information. Thank you, Victor. I'm sure uh, all the councillors uh, can understand the, the, the pain and hurt that the Rainey family are feeling at this moment. Um, I'm not sure what the protocol is, but I think uh, I think we'll leave that to another night. I think it's just the, the fact that we, we note that uh, very sad news at this occasion. Okay, I'm going to go now Back to the meeting. Unfortunately, we do have to carry on, and I'm going to go to Councillor Maguire for apologies. Sorry, Tommy. Hi, Guru Margaret. John, thanks, John, and and I think we're all deeply shocked at that uh, news. Uh, and we all offer our support, Alan, at this time. I suppose that's all we can say. With the immediacy of the shock, it's, it is shocking. So we're all very sorry about that, but. Uh, Back to the business. Uh, apologies from the Sinn Féin group, uh, Councillor Michael Dove and Councillor McCaffrey. Thank you, Tommy. And going to go back to Victor again. Uh, no apologies from the Oxford Unionist group, and obviously apart from Councillor Rainey. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. And I'm going to go to Paul Robinson. Thank you, Chair. I know it's very sad to hear that news, Senior. Young Rainey come and our sympathy goes to the family, Rainey family at this time and that, but no apologies from the Democratic Unionist Party. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Paul. Uh, next, uh, Councillor Mary Gardy, half the SDLP. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Likewise, um, condolences to Alan. Terrible, sad news, but uh, no apologies. Is uh, any of the smaller parties or independents? Uh, Councillor McAleer in the chamber. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, obviously, firstly, passing on my condolences to Councillor Rainey and his family at this um, sad time. Just how yes, Jago on him on his on his tragic loss there, and that's a horrible way to start the meeting. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, in terms of the business at hand, I have an apology for Councillor Eamon Keenan, who's actually also attending a, a funeral of a relative today as well. So he's unfortunately not going to be able to make the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Emmett. I also have an apology here from Councillor Swift, who is unable to attend tonight as well. So, so we'll note those. So thank you very much, everybody. And I'm sure Alan will appreciate all those messages and we'll be able to catch up with them in the near future. Next item on the uh, agenda is to sign the minutes of the confidential of the previous meeting and the confidential minutes of the previous meeting held on the, on the 5th of July. And I've already done that. So the next is any declarations of interest. I'm not seeing any in the chamber. And Councillor Thornton, I'm seeing on WebEx. 
Uh, Chair, it's item 11, it's the minutes of the past meeting with regard to the estate matters therein, as I live very close to the venue. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. I'm not seeing anybody else indicate, so I'm assuming that's all the decorations of interest. If anybody comes aware of something, they obviously they'll, they'll know to come in themselves at a later stage. So next we go, matters arising for the, the meeting on the, the uh, 5th of July. So matters arising, page one, page two. Lost my notes here. Page three, page four, page five, and Director John Boyle wants to come in on page five. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, yes, there was a discussion on uh, from item six point one about motor home overnight stays. Uh, there were a number of actions, and one of them uh, said that we would bring a report through to the September meeting of environmental services. Uh, just to inform members that that report will be coming um, in the October. Um, there are a number of issues from trying to bring a composite report on all issues pertaining to, to motorhomes uh, at the October meeting. Um, just to make members aware, and they probably are very much aware of the, the huge uh, online uh, correspondence and, and comments in relation to motorhomes, especially in, in the Enniskillen area and in the Round O. Um, and just to, just to remind members that a decision was taken at, at the July Environmental Services Committee as to the position of the Council um, and that that would still stand and I suppose there, there's, there's, that decision is taken, it hasn't been called in and, and therefore you know, the, the ability to, to uh, revert on that uh, is, is very limited. Thank you Chair. Thank you John. Uh, you've heard John's update there. Um, we'll, we'll not be taking a discussion on this but I'll be looking somebody to note John's update on this uh, again when we have the full information, perhaps that would be the best time to have a further debate on this. So I see Councillor Robert Irvine. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I'm happy to note the correspondence. Uh, I would ask that the directors, I know we can't do any discussion for a minimum of six months, that's so probably going to take us into the next mandate. I think it's an issue that we, we did maybe about seven or eight years ago, tried to see if the private sector would avail of any interest sort of within the confines of the land available that the council has around in the skill. I think maybe uh, that's time to be revisited, but after six months or something like that. So I'd just ask the, the director to note that and keep that in the back of his mind. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Chair, if I, if I can just come in, one of the, one of the actions which were, was arising out of, out of a July meeting was that we would look and with the private sector in, in looking at an air to service uh, motorhome park or whatever in the vicinity of Enniskillen Town and, and that, that is ongoing at this present time. Yep, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Councillor Irvine. Robert, uh, Councillor Paul Robinson. I just second that. Thank you, Paul. So, going on to page five, page six, page seven, page eight, and page nine and uh, director john news wants to come in on page nine yeah chair just to note that uh, correspondence has now uh, been received from a uh, divisional roads manager uh, western division in regard to the uh, request for some further information about uh, roads and uh, members access to uh, dfi roads officers uh, within the area so the correspondence is included in the pack thank you john so page nine, page ten, page eleven, and uh, John Boyle, you want to come in there? Page eleven. Yeah, chair, just to uh, to know correspondence uh, from uh, in in relation um, to from NI Water. Uh, in, in relation to requests that we had from the Derg and, and Lynn Horgel Water Treatment Works um, detailing the risk that was presented to the public and, and the quality of the drinking water and the level of MCPA present samples of at the Derg Water Treatment Works at, at, at July. Um, members will see the response there from NI Water. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Emmett, Michael Eyre. Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks to the Director for running through that. I think actually reading the response, and although we do have a response, I would actually say that the the letter in front of us actually fails to answer the three questions that we asked of NI Water 
Um, the, matter the matters raised in the report were serious, and the failure by NI Water to answer these, que these reasonable questions is actually quite alarming. While the other information in the email is of interest, it's important that we get a response on the questions that we actually asked. So I'm proposing that FODC write back, thanking them for their email and asking for our questions to be answered. And again, asking further, why, why were the public and, the, and this council not alerted at the time of these serious incidents occurring both in Castle Derg and at Glen Horgel? And surely the public have a right to know uh, what happened, what the associated risks and dangers are. Uh, this email goes on to raise further issues as to whether there is an effective emergency detection or diversion system in place to prevent this or other high-risk pollution in raw water and in both the Glen Horgel and the Derrick systems. And another question is arising. Uh, another question arising from this is whether pollution prevention systems are sometimes not actually switched on until such an incident occurs, and at that stage, is it already too late? I think the fact that these incidents happened some time ago does not lessen their seriousness and Council has a responsibility to ensure both that there is accountability and that effective and timely action is taken to remove the risk of a similar situation happening in the future. So I just make that as a proposal, Chair, and i uh, happy to note the, the correspondence received as well. Thank you, Emmett. Uh, Catherine, are you looking in on this or were you looking in earlier? Sorry. You missed me earlier. Um, Sorry. I'll come back to you if that's okay. You, you don't want a second, Emmett Snowden. My eyes ground, I will. Let yeah. Uh, Bert, I think I know where you're going to come in here. Uh, Chair, yes, I uh, had it there in interest in uh, this uh, debate to do with the uh, Northern Iron Waters. Okay, thank you, Bert. That's noted. Uh, we're not getting any. Oh, Donald, come on in here in there, Donald, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I was, I was going to second the proposal, but <clears throat> I have to say I, I totally agree with what has been stated there by Councillor McAleer. Frankly, um, having had quite a, an extensive involvement with a uh, number of cases with NIEA, I genuinely have no confidence in NIEA uh, providing really any significant level of protection for our environment here in Northern Ireland. My experience has been absolutely consistent in terms of how poor uh, the outcomes achieved are. And I know, unfortunately, that is not an opinion that is unique. It is almost ubiquitous across all environmental activists, um, you know, campaigners of any around anything. And, and here we have a document here which basically states that uh, instead of addressing the question which we raised, which was around public health concerns resu resulting from contamination from water supplies, we have a, a response which basically says uh, you should be happy because at least we've removed most of them or some of them and there's less now than there was in the source water. Uh, it's completely inadequate. There is no independence of this. It's part of uh, DERA and I think that that was put in there for the reason of making it a toothless empty shell and I, I think while we should certainly write to them, uh, I. What is absolutely needed is uh, a truly independent uh, environmental protection agency for Northern Ireland. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Donald. Uh, Councillor Deacon, do you want to come in there now? Yes, sure yes, thank topic. you, Chair. Uh, and Chair, may I just preface my remarks by saying that I am totally in shock at the very sad news that Councillor Warrington has uh, uh, delivered to us tonight. Uh, the pain and the grief is simply unimaginable. And I certainly am holding uh, Councillor Rainey and his family in my thoughts and prayers tonight. So my condolences to him. In relation to this matter, Chair, I'm sure you will agree that it is a very serious matter. One of the things that we need absolute assurances on is the safety of our drinking water. I mean, uh, this um, correspondence uh, indicates to us that we really should have no cause for alarm. But I'm afraid, in my view, there is cause for alarm. I think uh, the actions that have put in place are too little, too late, and they certainly do not uh, reassure me. So um, remedial action is needed uh, to address uh, the quality of our water supply. And I am in agreement with Councillor O'Coffey regarding the need, the urgent need for an independent environmental 
agency and in fact this was one uh, suggestion I made to uh, the Minister for DERA when he uh, um, visited the Council last year but um, so far uh, the Minister is not minded uh, to, to, to introduce those measures which I believe are necessary Chair. So I want to support Councillor McAleer's proposal, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. So you've heard the proposal and you've heard it seconded. Is there any contrary? No, so that's that proposal passed. Uh, Catherine, I'm going to come back to you now. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, we're back to uh, the, the letter from the Department uh, uh, for Infrastructure. Um, so um, I've been contacted by a constituent uh, very proactive in preparing for his business for the winter months. Um, I think my colleague, uh, Seamus Green, may have uh, brought this up last year about uh, the provision of grit uh, for uh, farmers. I think Seamus uh, had, had proposed it. But I have a constituent asking if it can be uh, provided on the road approaching his business, uh, which has very early morning traffic coming to the business and from it. And there's a particular part of the road on Camrock Road that uh, gets very icy with uh, even the slightest frost. And he would need to have access to grit because of his business. Um, I think it's great that the constituent uh, is offering to grit the road. And uh, we're often hearing from the department that they don't have the workers to go out. So, you know, if we have business owners willing to go out and do the work themselves, I think uh, you know, it is important that the Department uh, for Infrastructure assist them in that by providing the grit. Uh, so I'm proposing that we write to the Department uh, with that instruction uh, and that proposal. Uh, and um, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder, Catherine, would you note the, the, the correspondence? Of that course they, I would. Yep. Yep. yep thank yep, you. Yep. Um, Stephen, are you coming in on something similar to Catherine? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to come in. That's uh, Councillor Stephen Cahn coming in there. Okay, thank you, Chair. Just to come in to second that proposal, it is timely to come into the winter months and uh, it's an excellent idea, so happy to second that. Okay, thank you. I'm going to bring in, Councillor Paul Robinson had uh, something he'd indicated he wanted to bring up under any other business, but I think it's in a similar vein, I think it would be appropriate if, it, if he came in now. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. You know, I have been contacted with people you know, last night and the day about flooding on the main roads, not there. Colleagues not read, and I think the A4, I respected myself today, and from Final Town right to Maguire's Bridge, the colleagues are completely blocked. The traffic came to a standstill last night at Coldbrook because the roads were that bad, they flooded, the water couldn't get into the manholes, and the traffic had to sit for five minutes in the main road to let it away. So I would ask to write the road service that these water, that the manholes along the side of the main roads and the water tables on the rural roads all be cleaned urgently. Now, wait until now till the rain comes to clean them. I think that should have been prepared before now. So, can we put a letter to road service on that? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Uh, are you coming in to second there, Howard, or Earl, sorry, or Councillor Earl Thompson? Yeah, thank you again, Chair. And I want to second Councillor Robinson's uh, proposal. That is a very dire situation of, on, a, on a road like the A4 that things have to come to a standstill because of the lack of the cleaning of the manholes and gullies. So I'm happy enough to second that. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. Okay. Uh, that's that that's sorted out. I forgot to do that. But uh, when I move, start moving on, we're page, page 11, page 12, page 13. I'm not seeing anybody... Uh, Councillor Deacon, are you looking back in again? Apologies, Chair. I've taken my hand down. Okay, thank you. So that's uh, matters arising completed. Oh, page 14. Yeah, sorry. So no matters arising. We'll uh, move on now to the business. What? I assume Stephen had seconded, Councillor McCann seconded that. Thank you. Studi had anyway. Uh, now we're on to the business. So, uh, first item is 5.1, sorry. And it's Director John News. 
Thank you, uh, Chair. This is the uh, monthly estate matters uh, update paper. Uh, so the paper uh, section two sets out a number of uh, key issues for decision. Uh, <coughs> the first is in relation to uh, Lusty Moor Island and uh, a management agreement with RSPB, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds uh, on Lusty Moor Island. Uh, RSPB have requested permission to carry out works on the two funded projects. Uh, <clears throat> the purpose of the, the works will be to open up existing breeding habitats and to protect the ground nesting curlew and snipe from uh, predation during the breeding season. And it's recommended that the council would approve uh, these works and that the management agreement would be reviewed and updated to reflect uh, future RSBP proposals. Uh, we've also similar management agreements in place at two other uh, sites across the district at uh, White Island South and uh, Fernie Island, and we would intend to uh, review those in due course also. Uh, section 2.2 then sets out a number of uh, requests for uh, use of uh, council property uh, in the uh, upcoming uh, days and, and, and weeks. Uh, and section 2.3 then sets out some retrospective <coughs> approvals for council property uh, that had come in during the, the summer months uh, and uh, they're set out for retrospective approval. Then section 3 sets out a number of matters for information. Uh, 3.1 is uh, lands at Gorchin Village Park and uh, a 25 year lease that's held by Owen Killew Development Company. Uh, the club submitted a funding application for additional and replacement lighting uh, at the village walkway and uh, confirmation has been provided. Uh, that is appropriate for council to uh, consent to the works, which will be subject to uh, compliance with all the statutory necessary statutory approvals. Uh, we've also uh, information in there from uh, Tomory Athletic Club uh, regarding proposed development of uh, lands that they hold on a 99-year lease through until March 2099. Uh, that would include uh, development of a play park, walkway, 4G pitch, uh, flood lighting, fencing, dugout, spectator stand and associated works. And uh, under the terms of the lease with the council, the, the club have uh, requested the council's approval as the landlord. Uh, I've also noted an update on at 3.3 in relation to lands at Actor Work uh, Florence Court. Uh, members will recall that uh, we had been working and we provided a, a more recent uh, update on uh, just before the summer uh, months had, had kicked in and work that officers had done. Uh, we have been uh, trying to engage with uh, Forest Service over uh, the, the summer months uh, and that has just proved uh, challenging uh, to get a, a date in the diary. Uh, but we've now been in contact with Forest Service setting out a, a timeline and uh, an intention to bring a, a report back to uh, Council uh, in October uh, committee meeting. Uh, and then finally, 3.4 uh, sets out a number of uh, use of council venues and facilities and uh, 3.5 lists uh, sealing of some documents. Uh, so that's a culmination of some uh, legal and conveyancing uh, work that has been ongoing based on previous decisions by council. Uh, so uh, the recommendations are set out in uh, section nine. Uh, so the council approves a request from RSPB to carry out works at Lusty Moor Island. Uh, council approves the use of council property and the, the list is set out in 9.12 and retrospectively approves the use of uh, council property as set out in 9.13 and finally the council notes uh, the request to set out in 9.24 through to 8. Thank you John and uh, go first of all to the chamber and it's councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you Chair, yeah, there's a, a lot in this uh, report I suppose some of it I would be uh, very much in favour of and some of it I would have a, just a couple of questions about um, there's three I suppose sub substantive points I want to just uh, touch on um, during my contribution here um, the first there 2.1 in terms of the, the project at Lusty Moor Island now um, recently I was able to get out on the uh, breeding waiter cruise this time last month actually um, and I got a real sense of uh, appreciation of the work that's been carried out and done there Um by the RSPB and the Loch Iron Landscape Partnership and groups like uh, Curlew Life and the Loch Iron Weirder. So that's definitely something I would be fully in favour of, obviously, um, trying to get the the populations of these uh, increasingly rare birds is something that I would be fully in favour of. And I would actually like to see that rolled out right across the, the counties of Fermanagh and Tyrone, I think. The Sparrens being an area historically rife with the likes of Curlew, uh, Snipe and Lapwing, it would be ideally suited to that. And as I say, they're all under threat at the minute. So that's something that I would wholeheartedly lend my support to. 
Uh, item 2.2, and this is kind of a recurring one, but I have been approached by uh, a community group just in relation to the the uh, proof of public liability indemnity. So I suppose I have a question around that in terms of the flexibility and I suppose encouraging the council to use and employ that flexibility in a sensible way because I would imagine that the council as a group itself, as a body, as an organisation, as an organisation, already holds public liability uh, indemnity insurance for these sites. Um, and I know just this group in question was looking, I think it was the Oasis Plaza for an hour or two. It was impossible to get it for that short a period of time. They had to take it out for a full day and the cost then moved into the hundreds of pounds. So being mindful, I suppose, of the times that we're in um, and the expenses that our public is, is experiencing at this stage, we should really be, I suppose, encouraging people to use council facilities. And if there's a way we can facilitate and encourage that, I think that's what we should be doing rather than rather than putting up uh, unnecessary barriers to using the, the public facilities or turning communities away because they can't afford it. The final issue then is in relation to um, 3.5, and that's on page four of the document. Item number six there, there's a grant of easement to SGN, and this is again a recurring bugbear of mine. Um, I would just ask, I suppose, what the proposed easement between the council and SGN entails and seek assurances really that the rights of the public aren't compromised when these services have to be brought back to public sector management. So I'd raise that as a question to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Next, we go to Webex and Councillor Sean Clark. Hello, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, Sean, go on ahead. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome the, you know, the development of known Kalu and Gorchen. I have been involved with, and I want to thank John and the two Johns actually for the work on this. So hopefully we'll take it to the next stage. Uh, do you need a proposal for those? I can propose for the know all those recommendations there? Yeah, thank you, Sean. Right, I'll propose. Thank you. And next we go to Councillor Bert Wilson in the Chamber. Y yes, Chair. Well, uh, I would propose the uh, adoption of the approvals for, well, uh, I would know there's about five, six here that are in Councillor Rene's area, and I'm quite sure he would be... Uh, proposing or supporting them himself, so I will do that on his behalf. Uh, 2.21, drunk one, playing fields, uh, which I'm sure the, the one, drunk one development association would make, uh, does make good use of. And 2.2.4, uh, 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 Ecclesville Forest, uh, uh, I'm sure the Oma Wheelers, uh, yes, they have uh, requested permission there, and I'm sure there's been no problem with that. Uh, Ecclesville Park, Fintna, uh, Fintna Community Forum, who are very active in that area, so I'm quite sure that that will be. And uh, 2.3.4, uh, which is Fintna Pierce. Uh, so I would propose that uh, we uh, agree to approve those. And I would also be, uh, there's some other ones here that. Uh, are to be noted now. Would, uh, did somebody else propose if I did? I second them. Yes, it's Sean's, yeah. Sean Clark's uh, proposal. Okay. You're, you're seconding it. Next, we go to Councillor Anne Marie Fitzgerald, who's on WebEx. Yes, um, Chair, um, I don't mind giving away because it was just something very, very quick for John. So I'm not sure if everybody else is good in or not. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to you then. I'll go to Councillor okay, Robert. No Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just for, uh, two things, point of information and a question to John News. Uh, point of information, the list of people doing curly protection and snipe protection, I think, as referred to by Councillor McAleer, there are several other organisations that actually do have land um, that they're carrying out uh, conservation work on in regard to these particular subjects, both on Lower Loch Earn around sort of um, Bow Island and the upper Loch Earn around sort of the Derry Lynn area and John, Director John Boyle would know some of the people involved out in, in those areas and they're actually directed from shooting organisations so 
uh, there's a lot of work going on. It's been recognised that we've got to protect these indigenous birds, and that's happening. The second, the question really is around 3.3 Achachork. Um, I, I raised this before. In your discussions, John, with the Forest Service, I would like you to bring up uh, the issue that we, as a provider, on a lot of MOUs in various forest locations, are actually doing work that the Forest Service themselves should do on their own estate, and we're getting no recompense for it in regard to revenue stream. We may be getting capital money, which is all very welcome, but we're actually not getting any revenue. And it's becoming an increasing burden uh, on the council, a burden that we want to do, but we should actually, as a council, be getting recompense with regard to a revenue stream. So I would like that brought up uh, in the discussions ongoing. We've made that point directly to Forest Service when we had an interchange with them, but we've got no response back from them. They've gone very silent. So maybe you would raise that again. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Thank you, Robert. And next we go to Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly in the Chamber. Thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to declare an interest in this item. As I had, was in late, so I didn't get an opportunity to do at the beginning. OK, I think that's Strum Quinn. Uh, it's Strum Quinn Healthy Living Partnership. OK, thank you, Anne-Marie. We'll go back to Councillor Anne-Marie Fitzgerald now. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, John, I was just, um, I know that I've been um, chatting to you before about the St Julian's Road um, Park with the gate and I was just going past all the day and the gate is still locked and as I said to you it's a park it's a walking park that's well used and um, with the nursing residential home opposite it and the demographic of people there is um, sort of like elderly people and it's caused not to be a bit of more hassle and people being unable to maybe walk down that little bit further and come back up again so have you um, any updates of when that um, gate at the top will be open, John. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if, I, I'll, if I take those in your first order, I will uh, follow up on that. And I know it has been added, the St Julian's Park uh, item has been added on to our, our maintenance list. So I, I'll follow up on that with staff uh, tomorrow. And uh, if Councillor Donnelly, if Councillor Fitzgerald is uh, content, I will follow up directly with her in terms of a, a timeline for that. Uh, so uh, that, if we're content with that one. Uh, in terms of uh, Councillor Irvine's uh, observations and comments about the engagement with Forest Service, uh, those points have been uh, part of the discussion and have featured in the discussion and have featured in uh, so the definition of the issues that we need to resolve with Forest Service and we will have those at the, at the heart of the, the conversations and in terms of any update uh, coming back uh, to the Chamber in, in October. Uh, so I'm going back then, I think it was uh, Councillor uh, McAleer's, uh, the relation to the, the proof of uh, public liability indemnity, so the intention of the public liability indemnifications is to uh, safeguard the council and uh, it's reflective of the level of public indemnity insurances that would typically requ be required of insurers. And uh, members are, may recall that when uh, we were renewing our own insurances uh, earlier this year, uh, that increasing uh, burden uh, was something that was noted by uh, our our brokers at that time that it's it's this was uh, indicative of the the way in which uh, risk is being managed within the insurance sector and uh, what we ask uh, of people hiring our facilities is broad is in line with uh, what would be required of our insurer uh, the uh, and then this was the second point then was around the the easement and assurance in terms of the easement this was just a note that uh, the uh, 3.56 the grant of easement this is really just it's a note of the sealing of documents uh, but happy to give the assurance uh, whenever this you know whenever this item will come up that uh, in granting a, a, an easement uh, for works to be conducted over council land the part of the consideration for that easement is that the lands are made good uh, when they're being returned to council Thank you, John. I'm going to go to Councillor Paul Robinson. Chair, you know, John has sort of explained it there, what Robert was on about. But if Robert wants a second, or I'll second that for him. Okay. Thank you, Paul. I think it, it's covered, but we'll note that. Okay, so that's that item. Do we need it's noted and so we can move on? Um, Come on now, 6.1, uh, street naming and numbering, and we go dual language, and we go to Director John Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Chair, members will be aware that we 
the new street name and number in dual language was was passed by the council here in December, I think it was, of, of 2021. And since that we have received, and I know there's been questions in the, in the chamber in relation to it previously, we have received um, somewhere in the region of 350 requests for dual language uh, uh, road namings. Um, this is the first batch that have been analysed. Uh, there are 28 uh, uh, street road names uh, listed, which have been analysed, and, and and the results are actually in in um, table one of 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 the report. Uh, the the policy states that fifteen percent has to be met from those people uh, on a particular street near or a street or road, uh, and depending on and that is taken from the electoral register itself. Um, and where that 15%, then there is, it is uh, the position of the council uh, that dual language can be uh, can be erected, uh, but with the residual discretion and, and protection of of uh, of members here in the chamber. Um, the in relation to the 28 uh, streets and roads, the minimum threshold of 15% has not been met on on three of the roads. One in Alta Work Road. Uh, Grogree Road and St Patrick's Park in 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 Rusley. and and therefore in accordance with the policy, the application for dual language ends at at this stage in relation to those other three. Uh, the other uh, twenty five are listed in in Table Two, and the translations are are included there. And these have also been verified in accordance with the policy uh, by an independent uh, person. Uh, the financial implications of it, uh, and this was reported previously, that it is quite an extensive process in order to undertake the, the, the street name and number. And it is in somewhere in the region of staff time of £925 per application. And, and also uh, for the, uh, the, the signs themselves and for the erection of those signs, uh, it is £400 per sign. Uh, for those uh, 25 applications, there will be required 116 signs uh, at an approximate cost, therefore, to the Council of 46,400. But we have included £200,000 in our uh, capital estimates for the 22-23 year in, in relation to the installation of dual language signs. Uh, I should say to members that we will be bringing uh, on a monthly basis uh, a a list of all of all these roads in the future for we're trying to get through these three hundred and fifty uh, up to the limit of of two hundred thousand pounds for 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 this financial year. Um, so, Chair, it is recommended that the council approves the installation of dual language signage for the street roads and and uh, and uh, listed in section two point seven of the report in accordance with the, with the policy which has been approved by council. Thank you, Chair. So, first, I'm going to Councillor Bert Wilson. Yes, Chair. I I live in a pretty rural area, and this moment in time, the number of uh, uh, signs that are missing and damaged and broken is, well, uh, people who don't know the area be ask, stopping and asking uh, as to where they are and where they should go to certain places. Would it not have been... Uh, uh, sensible idea in my opinion to replace those first uh, because there's, as it isn't, uh, if you have no sign would you not be better with some one sign rather than none uh, and uh, I would also query the, at the cost the raising cost and steel and everything else maybe the signs won't be made out of steel I don't know but there's still going to be a pretty uh, severe cost uh, raise at the Minute in time. Just a couple of comments or questions. Thank you, Bert. I'll go to Councillor Stephen McCann. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to propose the recommendation in this report. You know, there is substantial, you know, if you look at the numbers in the tables, there is significant interest out there in the community for this particular uh, policy of the councils, and it's great to see. So I'm happy to uh, propose the recommendations, Chair. I would like to just ask, and if you don't have it now, John, maybe you can give me a shout at some other stage, but from approval at committee till the sign goes up on the road, what's the average or rough turnaround time at the minute? You know, is it weeks or months or uh, it's probably a couple of weeks, I'm guessing, but I'm just wondering if you have an idea roughly because there's a right few who have got signs approved and are wondering where their signs are. So it's just to give us an idea. Yeah. Uh 
Chair, I suppose what we have been waiting on is a contract for the, the supply and installation and that has now been agreed. So it's certainly there has been quite a quite a lengthy delay in, in, in getting to, to the stage that we are at the moment. But we would like to think that if we approve these that they will be approved that they will be installed in the next number of months. It's certainly not weeks. Some something like this does require a bit of uh, a bit of time and, and, and you know uh, and working with the contractor in order in order to make sure it's done. But we would like to think in the next number of months. Like I say, we, we have a budget of two hundred thousand for this financial year. We will be trying as far as possible to get as many stains installed in this financial year as we possibly can in in, in up to the limit of the two hundred thousand pound. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Councillor Robert Irvine in the chamber. Thanks very much. Uh, I have a couple of questions for John, and maybe I'm, I'm seeking additional information for transparency. It was highlighted, uh, I think, two months ago before the summer recess in regard to the, the single road that came forward, the amount of signs that needed to actually be installed along a road um, could be anything from two up to whatever number. I think it would be useful and I would actually propose that it's required that rather than coming forward with a global figure, as you have in this report, that you actually come forward with an individual figure opposite each road. You obviously have the information, which actually then will indicate if we could have the indication of the number of signs that need to be put up on a particular road uh, at the cost. Uh, it would actually be more visible and more transparent, and then we can actually see. Second question is, this is a capital project, isn't it? A minor capital project. Have, and because of the staff time involved, you've, you've quantified the staff time as equating to £925 per uh, road, and I understand what's involved in that, and we have limited staff available. Has consideration been given from finance, the finance uh, director, to actually capitalise the staff time and carry it forward? Because predominantly the staff time involved is involved in capital work rather than of uh, a normal day-to-day -day nature, which is actually revenue consequence. So I would like to see whether we should be capitalising this and actually then including that in the budget. And that's my proposal. Thank you. Chair, if, if I can just come in there. Yes, um, go ahead. Certainly, in, with regard to including the number of signs per road, that, that isn't an issue, like you say, that is, that is available in, in the uh, calculation of the 116 signs in this instance that is required. With regard to the, the consideration of, of the capitalisation of, of the staff time, yes, it is a minor capital works project in, in totality. Um, I suppose I would point out that, as you can appreciate, all budgets are under pressure at this point in time, not just revenue. We have a very extensive capital program, uh, which, because of the rising prices, uh, inflationary prices that exist, and that uh, I know a report will be will be brought forward to members in in relation to the rising costs. But certainly, our capital budgets are also under pressure at this time, and we are going to have to prioritise. The capital projects which were agreed by members uh, in relation to what we are going to carry out this year and indeed for the next uh, five years which was agreed so um whilst we whilst we can capitalize this the staff the staff time we are actually robin Peter to pay paul in in a sense um and uh, you know at, at this stage the the the, the costs the 925 pounds that are available there are revenue costs some of the work that is involved in that in that nine hundred and twenty five pound is analysis of of the returns coming in is going up to the electoral office and and going trawling through the electoral register and all of those which would be more akin to to the capital costs and it may be that um, a road such as in the instance of of the report here where three of the roads are not are not actually going to be capital or the work isn't going to take place that there is no capital asset at the end of the day so i suppose it would be it would be more akin that 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 those costs would be a re on a revenue basis sorry robert we'll let let you back in again there briefly robert yeah john i fully accept that and i think we we are going to hear the issues of 
constraint upon our budget going forward because of the pressure in regard to standard of living um, and the whole issue of salary costs and everything like that. Though I do think, because this is an extensive programme and it's probably going to go over the next two to three or four years, go into the next mandate, I think consideration should be given uh, to part capitalising uh, part of the staff time. And I would like that taken away and considered by yourself and the relevant director and the chief executive and come back then. And if you're deciding not to, I need the rationale why you're not going to. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Councillor Paul Robinson in the chamber. Thank you, Chair. You know, as the cost of these here, I think they cost 46000 and I do all this, with the cost of stuff going up and all. And uh, I think this money could be better spent and putting up signs not there because the cost of living is, is crazy. And this chamber and councillors in this chamber have been shouting this last weeks, months about the cost of living and the way things go and everything's getting dear and dear fuel, hating oil. And our own residents, the residents of this area, are not fit to afford to feed themselves. Maybe old people are not there. Maybe we should be thinking of maybe putting this on hold and uh, trying to use the money to help our residents. I'll make that a proposal and then also second counter urban proposal. Thank you. Next, we go to uh, Councillor Catherine Kelly in the chamber. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm not sure how we uh, rationalise uh, the cost of living and road signage, but anyway, I'll leave that where it is, park it there. Um, I'd like to second uh, Councillor McCann's recommendation. Uh, we proceed with the proposal. Um, I would encourage those interested in dual language signage to, you know, to progress it in their own areas. It, it's very important uh, to some of our constituents that they do have the signage. On another matter, uh, I have been raising uh, two roads in my constituency now for uh, over two years. Uh, one road that has absolutely no road signage, Baroni Road. Um, uh, quite a number of people living on that road. Uh, and uh, there was uh, an incident uh, when I first raised this uh, where an ambulance was not able to find a house. Uh, now, I've been told... Um, on numerous occasions that the signage is on the way. And this, I just contacted the constituent to be, be confident that the signage is not up and the signage is not up. So I, I would like that raised with the appropriate people as a matter of priority. Uh, there's also Carrick Bug and Carrick Moore uh, housing uh, where signage has been promised for there as well, um, uh, going on about two years as well. Again, another incident where a, an ambulance actually drove past the, the, the housing there uh, and uh, uh, didn't uh, find the house um, as promptly as it should have. So uh, just I want to find out what's happening about that signage, if I could get a response uh, from those responsible who have said the signage is on the way uh, for quite a while now. Uh, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And next we go to uh, Councillor Seamus Green on Webex. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just a, a, a couple of comments. Uh, the first one, um, just to uh, respond to Councillor Robinson, uh, I would suggest maybe that if uh, he'd be better uh, to go to this party and get them to go back into storm and to try and get money out of people in the cost of living crisis would be a lot, it would suit them a lot better. Uh, I think that's where the major problem is, not road to anything dual language. Science. But then again, it seems to always be that if there's an Irish mansion, there's always a problem with it, you know, that it uh, ends up money or something, but uh, a lot of other things can uh, can be pushed through, no problem. Or they can just uh, uh, down to not go to work and storm it, and it doesn't matter about the people. But anyway, uh, that said, uh, could I ask uh, John St. Patrick's Park in Rosley? I seen there was a, a number, I think it was 11 re uh, replies, and there was only three of them. Uh, deemed that they were uh, acceptable. What, what's wrong with the rest of them, John, just for clarity? 
and I think the Grogley Road was 14.9%. I was talking to a resident on it today uh, who um, everyone else in the house had got it, had got the farm, but he hadn't got the farm. And uh, 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 it just goes to show if he had got the farm and sent it back uh, uh, with the, the other people in the house that did send it back, it would have been it would have met the criteria. So I'm just wondering what format is is used to uh, actually uh, send it out to everybody on the road. Is it the electoral register or, or what 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 is it, Joe? So just down two points. Yeah, chair. As the as the policy states, officers um, take all of the the residents from the elector register, and those are the people that are canvassed as to whether the and it is a simple canvas is whether they agree or do not agree uh, to the installation of the dual language signage, um, and it goes to all the residents which are on the elector register. It, with regard to St Patrick's Park, there were uh, eleven. Um, which are eight of those eleven which were not valid, um, six of them, and there, there are there are there's quite quite flexible uh, dates given as to when you return it. Uh, six of those eight were received after the closing date. Uh, on one other, uh, the the return was made, but it was neither to agree nor disagree. No box was text, ticked. And on another case, the person who signed it was not on the electoral register. It, it wasn't sent to that person. It was it was signed by it was signed by someone else. In in relation to Grogy Road, uh, two of the returns were received after the closing date. Uh, a further one was not signed, and a further two was signed by people who were not on the electoral register uh, at all. So th that's the reason why they they weren't uh, they weren't valid or weren't. Uh, uh, Regarded as be, as being valid returns. Okay, thank you, John. Next, we go to Councillor Tommy Maguire in the chamber. Agar Maguire, kindly thank you, Chair. I, I was coming in the second, but that's already been done. But uh, uh, just uh, on on Councillor Irvin's recommendation to capitalise the revenue cost, uh, which would obviously reduce the overall budget. Uh, as a member of the grant aid panel and, and, and acknowledging the amounts of money that we have administered through that over the years, uh, I think if we applied the principle of capitalising the revenue funding, it would seriously reduce the amount of grant aid and, and capital funding that we have provided through that group. Just uh, want to make that simple point. And it, it is, it's a strange calculus to come up with when uh, we're specifically talking about the dual language. It's unfortunate again, but it's already through, it's approved and it's in process. So I welcome that and uh, congratulations to all those that have been successful in their applications and just to encourage any other streets and neighbourhoods out there that uh, be aware of our policy if you can and uh, to encourage your neighbours to engage in this uh, process which is uh, uh, has been generally regarded as very positive across the district. Next we go to Councillor Donald O'Coffey on Webex. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, people will know of my uh, concerns around the approach we've taken in regard to this. Um, and I have to say that some of this is kind of highlighting to me uh, why we you would be a bit concerned. Um, it's, it's genuinely disappointing, some of the results are. Um, like, one person on a road out of 21 returned uh, an interest in a bilingual sign. Um, and another one, it was three residences, as I think, Councillor, and it was in Rosley, yeah, three out of 77. And, you know, you just, uh, I wonder whether this formulation really is emphasizing the right thing, which is trying to actually get people to engage with the Irish language, to speak it, to use it, to celebrate it. Um, like we've in the South, for a hundred years now, there's been bilingual signs in every corner, but they've destroyed and allowed the Irish language to be almost destroyed. It's almost, uh, they've done nothing for the Irish language for a hundred years and the Irish language community had to rise up in the sixties to fight for something. And um, and I don't think that this is really helping actually. Uh, I, I, I also look, um, there's Kingston Road. I don't even know if this is Kingston Road 
13 people voted against it, four voted for it, and it's going to have it. Uh, I, I, I hope it doesn't create negativity towards the Irish language, but that's my fear. And I say that as, as someone genuine with Deneen on one side of me and the Bill Educus of the others on the other side of it, me. I, I, I love the Irish language. I think it should be something we really treasure and preserve. It's got huge applicability and wealth for all of us. But I, I don't see that this is really... Um, I don't agree with this approach. I think that it's divisive and it's uh, it's, it's about polling people uh, about a language which we all uh, should uh, use and, and own and have possession of and celebrate. And I I just, anyway, that's just what I think. Thank you, Councillor O'Coffey. Next we go to Councillor Earl Thompson in the Chamber. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Interesting debate as usual. Uh, I, I just want to, first of all, second uh, Councillor Robinson's proposal. Uh, we talked last night at, the, at our meeting uh, with regard to the cost of living crisis that we're in and having a special council meeting. And this money definitely could be better used at this time. This is a time of crisis. Uh, I take note of Councillor Green's comments about my own party not being uh, in Stormont at the minute. Councillor Green and everyone else knows the reasons why, and we're not going to rehearse that here at our level at Council. There is a reason why they're not in there. When the, when the criteria is met, they will be back in and doing their jobs fully. So I'll just leave that at, at this moment in time. Uh, so the, the Democratic Unionist Party, Ruben here in the Council, will be voting against uh, the recommendations here this evening. And can I uh, request a recorded vote, Chair? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Uh, next, we go to uh, Sean Clark. Councillor Sean Clark, is your hand up to speak on this subject? Yeah, just briefly. Um, I think one of the problems is, Seamus has mentioned this too, but, but I don't think they're using the most up-to-date registers yet. And that's why a lot of people have been missed. Um, that's just my, from my, from something locally I know about. I don't think the registers are using the most up to date registers. Thank, Thank you, Sean. Sir. Thank you, Sean. We'll note that. Uh, Councillor McCann. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and I just see clarity from, from the top table there that I propose the approval of the recommendations and was it seconded and was it agreed? If so, I believe that the proposal coming from across the chamber uh, is in direct negative to that and shouldn't be shouldn't be heard. Right, well, we haven't put any proposals to the meeting at the moment. Dan corrected then, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next we're going to go to Councillor Adam Gallon in the chamber. Thank you, Chair. I believe it. I believe it was seconded by another kind of Councillor Kelly's indicating there. Um, obviously, it's good to see uh, streets and neighbourhoods and, and the public engaging with this policy. That's what it's there for, uh, and it's good to see the promotion of the Irish language uh, across the district. Uh, I do have a question. Maybe the the directors can guide me on this relating to Councillor Robinson's proposal. He's proposing we ignore uh, a standing council policy. Are you saying that's what I am taking from his proposal? Uh, can we vote to ignore our own policy? Uh, would it not be a, a proposal to change policy that would be required for that? Uh, as far as I'm aware, we can't vote to uh, go against our own policy. I'm going to bring in uh, Officer or Director John Boyle on this. Yeah. Chair, I suppose in relation to it, the, the policy was agreed in December of, of 2021, which is nine months ago. So we can change the policy. Um, so I, I, I would think the best course of action is that there is a proposal to revisit the policy, if that if that is the position. Um, instead, I don't think we can put it on hold. Uh, in that we have uh, we have a council decision on 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 the course of action on which to move forward. So we could we could take a proposal to look at the to look at the policy again since we are outside the 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 six months period. Yes, going to bring in Councillor Mary Garty. 
Okay, John, that wasn't the proposal, and like what Adam was trying to um, explain to the Chamber and WebEx, that really it was an invalid proposal, which didn't stand up. Therefore, the only proposal on the table was the one made by Stephen and Catherine. Um, he didn't. We can't put words into councillors' mouths. Report, well, I, in my opinion, his uh, proposal was invalid. So therefore, was not a report. So um, that's not the chair should have ruled on it at that stage, in my opinion. But I can understand the debate was going on. As far as I'm concerned, chair, we have one proposal on the table, and that's the vote we have to take because that's an irrelevant proposal. I think the debate has went on quite a bit too, chair. Bert, you've already been in on this subject, um, and you didn't make any proposals. Councillor Robinson, I'm going to ask you to clarify your proposal. I asked, proposed that they put it installed, not, not put back, but stalled at this time because of the crisis, living crisis, put the money towards that, maybe. Thank you. I didn't. I mean, you, you've already been in on this and haven't made a proposal. The proposal was proposed by Councillor McCann and I believe seconded by Councillor Kelly was for the paperwork. So um, I'm not going to let any new speakers in on this or anybody who's spoken before on it. Um, we have nobody else indicating that they want to speak. So... The proposals we have are that the first proposal was that uh, we go with the the recommendations of the officers, and if we go with that proposal, then the other one will automatically fall. Is is my so so that's that's what we are going with, and the proposal is that we adopt the uh, recommendations of the officers as proposed by Councillor McCann and seconded by Councillor Kelly. That is correct. Okay, so call for a recorded vote. And uh, IT, if you can set that up for me, please. Sorry, Councillor Evan, you've spoken on, on this. I'm, I'm Point of information, Chair. He did. He made a proposal as well. And yeah, that's that's just what I was clarifying, and yeah. it wasn't in connection with the proposal from that was seconded with regard to the directors come forward. It was a side issue. So yeah, well, that, we'll come back we, to that because yeah, I don't okay. think that that's that, right, that stands alone from 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 what is proposed here. Councillor McAleer, you with the vote. So we've already gone to the vote, Amit. So I'm. Not sure what I'll let you speak briefly, but I'm not sure what you're bringing up. Yeah, chair, sorry, chair. It's just a very brief point, I suppose, on procedure. I've previously called for a point of clarification or a point of uh, a point of information, and I've been told that no such provision exists within the standing orders. So I'm just wondering why it's been permitted tonight, and uh, when it has been excluded previously, chair. Thank you. I think that's down to my interpretation of the rules, Emmett. Uh, so, uh, as the chair, I have interpreted that to be the way that I think is the best to resolve the situation. So, uh, we're now going to go to the vote. <laughs> Sorry, I pressed the wrong button, IT, if you could change mine. What? No. I don't think I can. What's up, Stephen? What's up, Stephen? Chair, just, just a query, please, Chair. This is listed as vote two. Just can you clarify? The chamber hearing me? Sorry, Councillor Armstrong. We're voting on the proposal by Councillor McCann, seconded by Councillor Kelly, to adopt the recommendations of the officers. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Chair, Chair, Councillor Armstrong again. I'm sorry, I've gone over my time limit because of my question. Chair, I share a similar concern. Um, I was waiting for the response for Councillor Armstrong's question as well, and I missed the voting time. I, I think we've made I've made such a horlicks of this, and in the in the chair, well, uh, and uh, I can see no other way around it, and that whilst we have made one vote, we're going to do the exact same vote again, and and, and that will be the one that we accept going forward. So apologies to everybody. Yes, thank you, Tommy. That would be an excellent idea. Tommy's going to propose to. Redo the vote. Okay. Sorry, Margaret. Uh, Carly, given the confusion and, and the, the lack of time afforded to some members online there, Chair, I'm proposing that we cancel that vote and that we carry out a new vote. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. And that's been seconded by Councillor Irvine. Sorry, IT. Uh, um, we're really giving you a difficult week. Um, is there somebody online has a, a large clock in their living room? We're getting a ticking noise here in the chamber, or else we're just going to get start getting worried. Those that are old enough to recognise what ticking noises were. No chair, it's the uh, countdown for the vote. Okay, the thank you. Thing. Hi, Chair. I think there's somebody's microphones on. Okay. So four nineteen against five and eight abstain. So that motion is carried. We now come to Robert Councillor Robert Irvine's motion. Uh, Councillor Robinson's motion falls. And if they wish to bring another motion in to look at the actual council policy, that that will be something for another day. Uh, Councillor Robert Irvine's proposal was to look at whether the. Uh, the matters could be looked at as as, as uh, councillor. And if you come in and just clarify that, so as I get the wording right. Sorry, that's me. The proposal was twofold. One, I wanted more information and visibility on each road with regard to the makeup of the signs, and that's easily extracted, I believe. The second one was. Um, to actually capitalise all or part of the staff time involved in the processing of these. 
And I wanted that brought back if it's going to be knocked back, the rationale in regard to why it couldn't be capitalised. So that's the joint proposal. Thank you very much. OK, so you've heard the proposal from Councillor Irvine and that's uh, seconded by Councillor Robinson. And I'm going to Councillor Maguire. Thank you, Margaret. John, I, I do have a question on that, obviously, uh, before I would make a vote on it. Uh, can this be done? Is it normal? to capitalise revenue? Has it happened before? Uh, what would be the impact if this was changed, as as I stated earlier, that could this would this apply to all uh, funding going out from the Council in relation to all our grants, capital or otherwise? Because it, it is a far-reaching and a, a major change in the way we carry out our procedures financially. I'd have very grave concerns if we start messing about like that given that we will be making some vital changes to our whole financial situation within the next few months. Chair, Gurmogan. Thank you. Hey, Chair, just, just in relation to the capitalisation of staff costs, I suppose in answering uh, Councillor Maguire's queries, it, it wouldn't be normal practice where staff costs associated with the, with a capital project, internal staff costs, would, would be capitalised. It, it is something that we can certainly uh, raise with, with colleagues in finance um, and, and see is there is there a mechanism by which we can we can do uh, we can do that. There are quite a number of projects which are ongoing at the moment with regard to um, in, in, on of a capital nature of which staff are involved in um, and it, it you know the repercussions of that on, on other capital projects would have to be considered by, by finance colleagues. Okay, thank you, John. Emma, to, is, uh, Councillor Magnier, I'm letting you in here briefly. I'm taking it as a question to clarify. Well, yeah, it's a, I suppose following on from the question asked and the response from the director there, I'm wondering if the pro pro proposer would either consider removing the capitalisation part of the proposal or splitting the, the two, because I don't think anybody in here would have any objection to openness and accountability and transparency in terms of the figures. But I think the difficulty is going to be the second part of the proposal. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Emmett. Come back to you, Robert. I... Yeah, I, I'm happy enough. It's a sensible enough suggestion coming from Councillor McAleer. Uh, Emmett, I, I'll split the two if my seconder is happy enough to split. Just to come back, actually, with regard to Councillor McGuire, uh, is it usual to capitalise uh, staff time if, they, if they're dealing with capital? It is actually normal practice in other organisations and it's carried out quite extensively in other public sectors, particularly in education. And I know, and I would have to declare an interest in fire and rescue, um, a lot of staff time that are working solely or partly uh, on capital right. works are capitalised. The Thank you, Robert, rationale behind it that? is to actually split the budgets. Right, Robert, Robert, I'm going to have to stop you. Yeah, yeah, that's OK. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Donald O'Coffey, have you a point? To, a yes, point I have. To thank the you, Director. Chair. It's not it's, to make a statement, it's to make a point. Well, it's in relation to this. I, I think it's very important that, uh, you know, this has been raised in relation to, uh, obviously, the Irish language. And I would hate to think it's because of the Irish language it's raised, but it does raise wider issues. Um, Capitalising uh, staff costs could uh, extend to any project management, and I'm sure certain nearly all. I don't. That doesn't seem to be management. a question. That's a statement. Well, I'll be getting my question fairly soon. I I just would wonder: is there any estimate of, you know, how much of our total budget would be potentially subject to capitalisation under these rules? And is there any indication that this may actually impl implement the rating uh, process? Because I would anticipate it would. It might make it easier in a way, but it would have to do it across the board. So it would be something I think we should investigate further. But um, I think it's much more wide than just one that the project. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Donald. John, can bring you in there. Yeah, no. Chair, it, like I say, it, it is wide reaching across many of the pro capital projects that we have. Uh, certainly, there would be instances where staff costs have been capitalised for large, major, major capital projects, which which the council are undertaking, it wouldn't be no, normal practice for a project uh, such as such as this. Um, but certainly, like I say, we can certainly follow it up with with finance colleagues and, and, and bring a report back to the committee. Okay, Councillor McGuire, have you a question? I, uh, it, it's no. Well, it's actually a, a point 
uh, that's of great relevance when if we do decide to do to change that tonight if this if this did get through uh we have already adopted the estimates for this year we've uh, adopted the the 200,000 as capital spend for this project within our estimates and now uh coming near the end of the financial year again we'll be facing into the estimates again we're being asked to change a, a whole financial arrangement with regards to the capital the capitalization of, of of revenue stream uh, that to me would fly in the face of the decision we made in regards to our estimates so i'm i'm very unsure about the whole uh, concept uh, i think our financial department couldn't accept it either but quite happy for it to go to the vote at this stage chair but i i really think it's a very strange pr uh, proposal at this stage of our financial year thank you councillor gallon again if it's not a question i'll cut you out it is a question uh chair um just about this proposal as far as I'm aware, it's capitalization for staff on just this project, is it? Because that would seem strange to do it for just one project and not all. Now, if we want to have a wider conversation about it and how we approach estimates in the future, fair enough. But um, that's not on the agenda tonight. And it's really, that would really be a huge discussion for us to have. Um, this just feels a bit strange. It's just for one project okay. when it's not normal practice. Right. Thank you, Al. Okay. So... We have two proposals. The first is that uh, each road name has the amount of signs that is required for that road included on it in the uh, report brought back by the officer. And I'm assuming there's nobody contrary to that. So the second proposal is, is uh, that we look, the officers bring back a report into the capitalization of the work required to bring the, the assessment of uh, the viability of placing the road names on a road. And, and that's proposed by Councillor Irvine, seconded by Councillor Robinson. So I'm assuming there's going to be dissent, so I'm going to put that to the vote. So IT, can you set up a vote for that for me, please? Is there anybody has any questions while IT are setting that up? So is, we can... Okay, everybody, that's the vote now open. No. No. Okay, everybody, there seems to be a small problem in the chamber. Those on WebEx have concluded their voting. and uh, So I'm just going to go back to the old system. So I'm going to go for a show of hands. So uh, the first is those four. Okay, okay if everybody takes their hands down, those against. And if you take your hands down, sorry, everybody. 
And um, I'm going to ask the question, but uh, I'm not expecting anybody because then we, we have a bit of a uh, vote early, vote often. Anybody abstaining? Okay, so uh, so so as we can get quickly moved on, that was four thirteen against twenty. So that motion falls or proposal falls. So now we carry on to uh, six point two, which is food hygiene. Uh, back to you again, John. You're John Boyle. That is sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Chair. I mentioned this at the July Regeneration and Community uh, Committee meeting um, so that this committee uh, could be presented uh, or could hear this report because of the deadline of the 9th of September for, for return of the consultation on, on the food hygiene uh, rating. This this is in relation, members will be aware that environmental health uh, give uh, food hygiene ratings uh, to food businesses uh, and increasingly uh, what uh, is that there there are online outlets for for uh, uh, food provision um, and this is in order to close to close that gap in a sense uh, the amount of online food ordering over the past number of years has really increased and and this is a uh, 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 an attempt by the Food Standards Agency in in order to try and rate those businesses in in exactly the same manner as as those uh, businesses on the high street. Uh, so the, the, it is out for consultation. Like I say, it is due back on the on the ninth of September, and the response is included in Appendix One. Um, and largely, uh, the response is is very positive in in relation to it, or the proposed response, the draft response uh, from our council. Um, I suppose there are a number of issues and clarification that have been highlighted in in the response. Um, one uh, is that uh, the council would seek whether uh, you know failure to display a, a food hygiene rating that there is there isn't anything in the consultation process as to what will be done if 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 that uh, if if there is an offence in a sense and is it is it enforced by fixed penalty notice so I suppose there is a question with regard to clarification in relation to it there is also a question or. or you know the implication on the council of the costs associated with implementation of this, in that there would be extra training that would be required uh, for officers um, in in relation to how exactly and how exactly the system works and and what you're meant to be looking for and and how it actually goes online and all all of those sorts of issues. So, um, chair, it is recommended that the council approves the draft consultation, which is included in Appendix One. Uh, of the report on the food hygiene rating on online display regulations 2023. Thank you, Chair. Seeing any questions? Is it the proposer and the second? Councillor Warrington proposes Councillor Paul Robinson seconds. Last uh, We're now on to item. Uh, we're now on to agenda item 7.1, and that's a uh, report on Northern Local Authority. Collected municipal waste management statistics, and we go to uh, Director John News for that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this uh, report on uh, Northern Ireland Local Authority collected municipal waste statistics for quarter four, and this is a uh, an estimate of uh, provisional light turn for the period January to March 2022. Uh, members will be aware that this is a, a periodic report, uh, comes uh, obviously four times during the year. It's uh, retrospective, and as noted in the report, the figures that are published at this time are provisional, uh, subject to the publication of scheduled revisions uh, by DERA. Uh, and the the annual report, the, the the full annual report for these figures will be published in uh, November of this year, and a report will be brought to members at that time. Uh, the uh, DARE report split into uh, four sections uh, set out in in the report, and some of the the key issues are highlighted within the paper. Uh, I suppose uh, draw members' attention to uh, two one one uh, local authority uh, total tonnage collected by local authorities in the period uh, January to March twenty twenty two. Uh, was uh, an eight percent uh, decrease on that which had been collected during the same period, twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty one, uh, and it's uh, been recognised and it's something that's been discussed that uh, that uh, decrease is largely attributable to uh, change in public behaviours and uh, some of the. 
uh, the conditions that prevailed at that time around COVID and uh, many people that were continuing to work at home. So the the figures generally within the report in this quarter uh, are showing more for a return to uh, pre-COVID uh, patterns of behaviour in terms of the collection of waste. Uh, other key figures that I know have been noted at 213 is that uh, we can see that 45% of the waste collected by councils was uh, sent for recycling, which again is a, a small decrease, 1.1% uh, on the recycling rate uh, in uh, the same period in 2021. Uh, the longer term uh, trend over the, the previous uh, 15 years, however, has been uh, significantly up in terms of the, the increase in recycling, but uh, there has been a, a, a drop uh, from the period uh, last year. Uh, some key points for uh, from Anonoma, I suppose members would wish to note that uh, the trend for the collection of waste is broadly reflective of uh, population and as you might then expect, uh, Belfast collected the most waste, while from Anonoma as the least populous district council area collected uh, the least tonnage. Uh, as we uh, flick uh, through into uh, 2.2.2, uh, you'll note there that uh, a number of councils, including ourselves, had reported a decrease in household recycling rates, and that's something that we uh, continue to focus on after our social message, our social media messaging, uh, public awareness, and an education, and uh, remains a priority for us as officers within the council and indeed for council. Uh, all the statistics set out there within the detail of the report on energy recovery and landfill and uh, reference to the landfill allowance scheme. Uh, so the information presented there for information uh, at this point in time for members and the uh, appendices are included in the report and there are hyperlinks to the, the full statistical uh, tables as well. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Councillor Donalow Coffey, you're first there. Donal, Councillor Donal O'Coffe. Apologies there, I, I was trying to get my hand stuck. Um, yeah, this is, um, I, I think this is a kind of concerning uh, report again as ever. Uh, it's always informative, but it seems our, the amount of waste that we are sending to recycling uh, and reuse composting has uh, fallen uh, at a rate that, you know, other areas have not experienced. Um, and so, I think you know we we need to be challenging ourselves. How is it that we can do better to encourage um, higher levels of recycling activity in our council area? And in particular, um, I there was a question there around the uh, the volume of recycling waste going to landfill, which is questionable, really. Why why are we like I think a higher proportion, if I remember right, of our waste going to landfill? is re, uh, is judged to be recycling um why can't that or recyclable uh biodegradable waste um why is uh, why is it that we're landfilling biodegradable waste as opposed to perhaps finding some alternative process to treat it that's really my question for the for the officer thank you chair you don't do you want to come in there john or do you want me to take another couple of questions Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Emmett McAleer, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Um, as we're starting off, I think the, the irony of today being uh, International Day of Clean Air uh, hopefully isn't lost on the Chamber when we're reading on page two that between January to March 2022, over a quarter, that's 27.7% .7 of waste horizons were sent for energy recovery, which is incineration. Um, that's a higher figure than January to March 21 and an increase uh, on the percentage from 2020. That's deeply concerning uh, and something I think that we need to be following up on and needs to be investigated. Page three, item 2.2.5. It's a, a matter of concern that from Anonoma District Council's waste to landfill has increased to 43.5%, and it's the second highest in the north in the figures given, equal to Lisburn and Castlereagh County, our council. And I note that Mid Ulster's Mid Ulster Council's waste to landfill was only four point three percent. That's ten times lower than this council area. So I would make a proposal that uh, our staff actually explore the significant difference with our neighbouring council, see what improvements can be made here in terms of dealing with that. <coughs> Excuse me. Fermanagh and also Fermanagh and Oma District Council also reported a decrease in household recycling rates for the period. Um, Surely our recycling and reuse could be improved. Uh, and again, we're looking at that around 43% as well. 
I suppose we have to see what we can learn from other councils uh, that we could adopt here in our district. And again, I've previously queried about whether the recycling figures recorded actually represent the weight on curbside collection or are they actual recyclable material that is going to be processed. As the harsh reality is that not only this district council, but right across the area, the figures could be much worse than, than us actually being reported. And again, finally, just picking up on that point that Councillor O'Coffey has made, I'd actually like to revisit a proposal that uh, Councillor O'Coffey and myself had made in terms of providing our entire district or at least those who have a, a, an interest or request for them with the full size brown bids, because there doesn't seem to be that equality or equity or rural proofing in current practice because only the inhabitants of Firma or of Oma and Emma Skillen are provided with this facility. And that will undoubtedly help counter the shocking figure quoted on page 5, item 2.6, that in Fermanagh and Oma, 65.3% of all waste sent to landfill was biodegradable. That's just unacceptable, and we need to look at how we can rectify that. And whilst it might incur uh, expenditure and cost in the short term, I think the long-term savings, uh, both financially and environmentally, will be uh, undoubtedly uh, very visible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And next we go to Councillor Catherine Kelly in the Chamber. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I second that proposal um, from Councillor McAleer on the brown bins as one of the rural constituents uh, 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 struggling with a wee uh, caddy. Uh, but I actually wanted to come in about uh, the recycling um, issue. And um, uh, recently on a visit to the recycling centre in Kerrigmore, uh, one of the uh, employees there informed me uh, that uh, there's no cover uh, on the the refuse, uh, uh, the big containers uh, that that hold the household waste, and then when 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 they would come to work on Monday, the birds would have bags uh, picked apart and rubbish uh, all over uh, the air uh, the actual centre itself, but also out onto the road, littering the road, uh, carrying all this household waste out. I did contact. Um, somebody uh, within the council about uh, uh, provi the provision of netting or or some kind of lid on top of these uh, containers that would prevent that. Um, and I think that it would be good practice, maybe in all our recycling centres, where that kind of provision is made. Uh, seeing as we're talking about littering on, 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 and, and the roads and everything else, I think it would it would be a very practical uh, solution, uh, both in the centre and uh, in the vicinity of the centre. Thank you. Okay. Not seeing anybody else indicating. Uh, oh, sorry, Earl's indicating there. Thank you, Earl. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. And... I don't disagree with the thing that uh, Councillor McAleer and Councillor Kelly had said there with regard to the larger brown bin and to the, the rural areas. Uh, I know when it was talked about initially, when, when we got the, the caddy and what have you, it was the expenditure issue and there was going to be a lot of money involved in it. I was just wondering, obviously it's hopefully going to be brought back now, maybe with a report, to see where we are, we are with that and what sort of a cost would be involved to put it out right across the district. If we can have that information, that would be very useful. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And just to come in and follow on from Errol's comments there, maybe it would be useful to consider in the report. Um, there used to be stickers on the bins to let people know what could be recycled to encourage flattening down the goods going into the bins to encourage people to recycle more. Maybe it might be worth considering how viable it is financially to put that sticker on all bins whenever the bin men are out emptying the bins to, to promote the recycling. If that, just to consider if that's a viable option in the, in the report, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor Podrick and Kelly next. Emmett, you've been in before and I will let you in briefly at the end. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, if Councillor Catherine Kelly and Councillor Amory Donnelly made those as proposals, I'm happy to second both of those. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Paul Robinson. Chair is coming in to second that, but 
Well, the issue was I brought in a bag one night from my daughter said, put out where you put your recycling in and it was all I told you on the side of the bag what you put into the into your blue bin and all. And was to be carried uh, the last director said he would look into it, but I never heard another thing about it. I never okay. seen anything coming out or never heard tell them anything coming out? No, I haven't. Right. Um Emma, I'm going to let you back in briefly. You were looking in there. Yeah, Chair, it was just to second the proposal from Councillor Kelly in relation to the covering of the recyclable waste. Okay, thank you. Uh, not seeing anybody else indicating, so John is going to have a go at answering all these questions. Queries? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, members, for, for the questions. Uh, if I can, uh, just maybe the, the specific uh, issue in terms of uh, Carrick War, I understand that issue uh, around uh, covers and uh, the panels at uh, Carrick Moor has been actioned uh, and the, the uh, head of waste has been in contact with the, the, the service manager, the service area manager and, uh, and, and the staff there, so that is being actioned. Sorry, hold on a second, Catherine. I haven't, I haven't indicated, I've lost you on my screen. Sorry, if I could just thank you. In. Yeah. Uh, I was down today, and and the, the employee there did tell me that that the, the the process had begun. But the reason I'm keeping it on the agenda is because, like the road signage, I'm afraid that it, you know it could do we disappearing act. Yeah. So no. uh, I just wanted to raise it tonight. But yes, he did inform me that the process had begun. So thank you on that. Thanks. That, that, uh, 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 thank you, Chair. It's, it's just it was on on that as, as a specific. I think a, a lot of the. I think a lot of the other points that are being uh, made, what I would say by way of summary, I think what we recognise in terms of uh, the, the refuse statistics and the, the recycling statistics is that we are dealing with probably one of the most intractable problems facing us as society, and it's very much around public behaviours. What Council does is collect the, the, the bins, it collects refuge, it puts in place the system. Uh, I think what the, the figures published by uh, DERA do is they benchmark a number of uh, you know particular indicators but what that doesn't necessarily take into account is that different councils will have different models of uh, of refuge collection uh, and uh, a number of the councils quite a number of, eight, eight of the councils actually uh, operate through uh, waste management groups as well so there are different approaches across Northern Ireland in terms of how uh, waste is collected and how things are categorised uh, issues such as the uh, the, the the caddies and brown bins those are all issues which are all that the uh, officers and, and and myself are, are looking at uh, you'll recall that we have initiated a waste transformation project and that waste transformation project is is to do exactly what i think a number of members have referred to tonight is you know continue to explore opportunities to improve all the time so that that concept of continuous improvement and uh, and, and particularly continuing to improve the performance of Fermanagh and Noma district council in respect of these targets is something that is very much at the heart of the waste transformation Transformation project. As part of that project, uh, we're engaging with uh, other partners and in, 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 well, other councils uh, to benchmark. And actually, as recently as this afternoon, uh, we had a conversation about how we could do that with some of our neighbouring uh, councils to look at examples of, of good practice in, in those other within those other district councils, including uh, Mid Ulster. Also looking at uh, further engagement with organisations like RAP, uh, again, to draw on best practice uh, from across these islands uh, and what has worked in other comparable uh, districts you know, el elsewhere within, uh, say, across across these islands that have a say, largely rural in nature with a, a large road network, uh, but a very dispersed population. So I think it's about comparing apples with apples, as we say, when it comes to looking at, at statistics. Uh, I think one of the things that we are mindful of is that uh, the, the target and the, the introduction of, of uh, food waste caddies, as I understand it, actually, this council is probably uh, one, of, as I understand, one of the only councils that will be fully in compliance with uh, some regulations that were introduced back in, I think it was uh, 2011, it was the uh, the, the food waste regulations in 2011, which required separate collections of food waste, and that was why this council introduced the food caddies at that time. Uh, now, not all, not every other council has uh, has followed that approach, but that that. As, as my understanding of why that uh, approach was implemented at that time. But again, as part of the waste transformation project, we are looking at all of the options in terms of how do we improve our recycling? Because that, it's really, it's the outcome that we're focused on in terms of uh, the intention of contributing to a more sustainable future. 
in the longer term. Uh, recycling, I suppose, in some respects, is only it's we're several steps down the journey. Uh, one of the things that we want to encourage through uh, education and public awareness is actually uh, a greater understanding about the importance of actually reducing and reducing consumption and uh, and looking at more sustainable forms of, of packaging. And undoubtedly, there is inter there's legislation that we know is coming down the tracks. Things like extended producer uh, responsibility and deposit return schemes. And again, we, we wait further clarification coming from Dara as to uh, what that will look like and the impact of that on council services. Uh, we have an ambitious uh, capital program uh, that members will be familiar with across our uh, recycling centres. And that again speaks to uh, one of the greatest areas where uh, we can make an impact on these figures. Uh, the tonnages that are reported within uh, these reports uh, take into account curbside collections, but also tonnage coming through uh, our household recycling centres. And certainly the experience of officers uh, previously is that we can make some very significant significant changes uh, by introducing uh, sort of, uh, simple but you know effective uh, changes to how we operate our, our recycling centres and that's around segregation of uh, rubbish and uh, our segregation of waste uh, and uh, the uh, material that's been brought into the centre and our, uh, the 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 orderlies uh, at our household recycling centres are actually a huge source of information in terms of assisting the public. Uh, so again, that's why with, when we talk about education and awareness, it's not just uh, social media, but it's actually in terms of uh, how our own uh, staff can interact with the public and support them to make the right decisions. But we're ultimately looking to uh, reduce consumption in the, in the longer term. Uh, we will, as part of the waste transformation project, uh, where and we have started uh, to uh, develop up a, a list of uh, potential workshops, and we would seek to be in, engaging members. I think we'd said previously in a program of workshops over the course of uh, the, the coming months uh, as part of that waste transformation, because it is about getting in under the skin of the data that's being presented in these quarterly reports and understanding the implications, uh, potential implications for uh, service provision and potential impacts in on uh, the residents across the district as well. Okay, thank you, John. Um, interesting times ahead for the, the rubbish business. Um, I didn't seek anybody to propose the noting and second of those. So uh, Anne-Marie Donnelly's proposing and uh, Paul Robinson is second that we uh, note the, that uh, document. Next, we're on to 7.2, and this is a document. And um, I think this one's only for noting, but it's over to John News again. Sorry. Councillor O'Reilly. Chair, yeah, I had my hand up here, Chair. Uh, just on the on the back of what uh, John said, could I uh, seek a little bit of clarification from him as to where the actual uh, figures are derived from uh, collection-wise and so forth, John? Is that collection-wise in the lorries that actually collect curbside and so forth? before they're actually deposited in the council. This is the recycling material and uh, before the contract uh, or who representatives come in and agree whether they're going to take that uh, load or not. So I'm just wanting to understand, do we have much refusal uh, whenever there is contamination and uh, where does that impact upon the figures? That's one aspect of it. And the second chair, um, as John is uh, well aware that we have initiated uh, through St. Kevin's College uh, program to try and educate uh, the next generations coming uh, to understand waste much more in depth and to understand that waste is not seen all the time as rubbish, but can be reused, recycled and turned into valuable commodities if handled and treated in the proper way. And I'm just wondering, uh, I'm not hearing anything from John about uh, the continued expansion of that, because I think, honestly, we're past the point, Chair, we hear that we're going to do better, but year on year, we're not doing better. And that's the stark reality. And uh, if we don't change fundamentally how people see waste and interact with waste, then we're not going to change because it, as John said before, it is habit and we need to to 
educate much more robustly. And I think that can be best done through schools. So I'm just wondering on those two different points, Chair. Thank you. And thank you for taking my question. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, back to you, John. Yeah, no, uh, thank you for the, the opportunity. So in terms of the uh, the data, uh, what I would say is that we have, a, there's a, there is a complex, a robust system in place at uh, our uh, Drummy and at uh, Gort Rush in terms of waybridges, which are connected into uh, a system that's known as waste data flow. Uh, that measures uh, tonnages in, so uh, lorries coming in, uh, the, the lorries going out, uh, the classification and the codification of, uh, of the waste that's been brought in and then the waste that's subsequently passed on. Uh, so that waste data flow uh, system is uh, goes through then to DERA and it's those, it's that's the, it's that data that uh, that DERA uh, st statisticians will be number crunching, and that's where the validation process comes from as well, which is why there is such a lag, I would say, with, with these figures that it has to go through a very robust uh, validation process, and that is why they are published as provisional at this time. Uh, in respect of, uh, and as my, my apologies if it wasn't uh, coming across and, uh, explicitly enough, uh, when I'm referring to education and awareness and, and public engagement, it's ex exactly the sorts of uh, project that uh, the council really has referred to. Uh, engagement with uh, local schools, uh, um, you know, there has been engagement and we have previously engaged through uh, partners such as uh, eco schools with primary schools and, and we know that that has been very effective in that setting. I think one of the areas for improvement that we'd identified in the last six months and uh, it was uh, particularly through the engagement with St Kevin's was looking at alternative uh, approaches and different approaches when it comes to post-primary uh, sector and particularly you know that that generation of young people who are our next generation of adults and at a time when uh, actually instilling those uh, those positive behaviours those good behaviours in, in terms of waste and uh, the Councillor really used the phrase about you know how people and, and particularly those those young adults perceive and interact uh, with waste that that is that's why that's so important. So examples of you know developing that partnership and actually we have a meeting uh, uh, we had a pilot project with St Kevin's in Listenski earlier this year and we have a. Uh, a roundtable meeting uh, with some of our external partners, including uh, Education Authority, uh, later this month uh, in St Kevin. So that is something that we will be seeking to build on and we'll be seeking to expand and we'll be encouraging our partners, particularly uh, through uh, forests such as Community Planning and Strategic Partnership Board, uh, to see you know where and how do we uh, expand and, and build on some of the learning from those pilot projects. But um, uh, uh, the, the post-primary education sector is only one sector. Uh, we also recognise that there's a significant contribution being made by other parts of civic society as well. And I suppose just given given my background, I suppose that you, you maybe appreciate, I, I'm going to say like particularly a lot of our sports clubs uh, have a very significant contribution that they can make in terms of they have an engagement and an interaction with young people. Uh, that, you know, a lot of adults who are in uh, positions of responsibility, coaches who are looked up to by those young people and how we instill, uh, the, again, positive behaviours and reinforce positive behaviours. And some of our, our sports clubs locally and some of the governing bodies associated with those uh, clubs, uh, I know they're taking that issue on board. So we'll be seeking through the education and engagement programme, again, to build on and develop those links over the coming uh, I'm saying uh, you know through the waste transformation project that the waste transformation project itself will be a finite project uh, but the the outcomes of the waste transformation project are that's where we see the longer term benefits coming from in terms you know developing those partnerships with education with civic society community voluntary organizations and members will have heard previously about a lot of the work that goes on in terms of the uh, uh, community litter picks uh, as well across, and that, that's another uh, very important area. So our, the, it, it is the whole picture when it comes to waste. It's not just about the bins that we lift, although that is, that's an extremely uh, important area of the services that the council provides in the statutory indicator. Okay, thank you, John. Now, I'm not seeing anybody else indicating, so we're going to move on to agenda item 7.2. and. That's going to be for noting. So, John, news again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, two elements uh, to note within this paper. The first is a report on actions uh, from Environmental Services Committee over the uh, the last quarter, May to July 2022 inclusive. Uh, members will note that we had a total of 78 actions arising during that period of time. Uh, 60 of them have been completed to date 
and the 18 are still in progress and uh, an overview of those that are still in progress uh, is provided within the paper as well. They are largely in progress are largely to do with uh, legal issues and uh, land and property service and conveyancing issues uh, and reports on the uh, a number of the other in progress items will be coming back uh, to council in, in due course. Uh, we've also noted at uh, 2.2 uh, some positive uh, news in terms of uh, work that uh, officers have been doing to uh, secure some external funding. And again, some of these have been highlighted to members previously uh, by way of seeking approval to apply. Uh, and particularly that was in respect of the Chewing removal uh, funding, the £20,000, and then uh, £98,700 from the uh, DERA Environmental Challenge uh, Programme uh, for some additional works at Kelly Fole uh, Loch uh, Local Nature Reserve. Thank you, John. Somebody proposed a note of that. Uh, Councillor Paul Robinson. I welcome the fund, Kelly Fold. It's now in my area, so I welcome it very much. Thank, Thank you, you Paul. for putting in the application. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Earl Thompson. Thank you, Chair. And yeah, I want to thank uh, Director John Hughes as well for his report, and I'll second it. Thank you. Thank you. So that's that paper noted. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Next, we come on to agenda item 8.1, fly tapping protocol on articles 4 and 5 of the Waste and Contaminated Land Order 1997. And that's Director John Boyle who's going to cover that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, it's just an update to members on the, on the proposed revised fly tapping protocol between the Northern Ireland Government Agency and, and all councils. Uh, members may remember that a number of reports were brought on this issue in, in the past, in November 19 and, and February 2020, and, and those reports are included in Appendix uh, 2 and 3 of the report. Uh, a fly tipping protocol currently does exist between the NIA and councils, and it sets out all that relationship the, between the councils and the NIA and defines the roles and responsibilities of each organisation in, in dealing with fly tipping and, and waste deposits. Um, that protocol has been reviewed by the NIA and a number of important issues have arose, uh, have arose out of that. One, one of them is in relation to the responsibilities um, in, re in relation to, to hazardous waste. In relation, I suppose, first of all, to, to non-hazardous waste, under the current protocol, um, councils will continue, or councils have responsibility for waste deposits of, of under 20 cubic metres and, and that will under the new revised or the draft revised protocol that that will continue a change does uh, take place on the on the, the the new protocol for for lifting of hazardous waste and that under the under the current protocol councils are responsible for for lifting of hazardous waste uh, up to two cubic metres uh, but under the new protocol they will have responsibility for hazardous waste under 20 cubic meters. So, so quite a quite a quite a difference in in responsibility for councils. Uh, for and it is stated on a term that uh, of hazardous waste that could be accepted at an appropriately authorized council operated civic amenity or, or waste recycling center. That the, it the, like I say, it does significantly increase the threshold uh, for dealing with hazardous material, um, and. As was that, that it has the potential to really increase the costs like of of council in, in dealing with with fly tipping incidents, the the, the not only the cost but the, the funding implications uh, in in relation for for local authorities, we, there is no funding uh, extra funding that is common with with the change in in the protocol to to the councils, um, and indeed the, the the support and the training, um, and so it is. Uh, it, that councils will will incur this cost themselves as a new cost uh, on 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 the rates. I suppose maybe which is maybe more worrying than the actual uh, hazardous element of what we are responsible for. But the articles four and five of of the Northern Ireland order um, have not been uh, transferred to councils at, at this stage. Um, but the 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 protocol actually does indicate. Uh, that it does intend to introduce the commencement of Articles 4 and 5 of, of the Act, uh, which places enhanced responsibilities on councils in dealing with, with fly tipping and, and um, uh, illegal dumping. Uh, articles, articles 4 and 5 uh, give new powers to the council uh, to, for investigation, enforcement, clean-up, uh, forfeiture, 
seizure of vehicles, prosecution in, in relation to dealing with incidents of, of fly tipping and, and illegal dumping. Um, and those are seen as, as complementary effectively uh, to the fly, fly tipping protocol in, in that the, the, the latest information that we have from NAEA is that the fly tipping protocol is considered to be a prerequisite to the commencement of all remaining sections of the Waste and Contaminated uh, uh, Land Amendment Act of, of 2011. There, there are, I suppose, in relation to this one, there are significant resource implications as well for councils taking on Articles 4 and 5. These are, these are responsibilities for which we have no experience of. This is actually policing of, uh, of waste um, and, and, and fly tipping in, in that, you know, you can only imagine uh, officers from the council um, uh, implementing the seizure of vehicles something which we have certainly never been re responsible for before. And again, uh, it is considered that these uh, duties would be enforced on, on councils uh, without any extra resources. Um, you know, we, we, we as a council, and a number of councils, I have to say, have signed up to the, to the new protocol. Um, but... I suppose the inference in, in the last communication that we have from, from the NIEA is that as we have not signed up to the protocol, uh, that the NIEA may not take on responsibility for any illegal waste, even over 20 cubic metres, that that would pass to the council themselves. So I suppose, uh, you know, there, there are decisions to be taken in, in relation to, you know, how, how our interaction with, with the NIEA uh, uh, Officers are still continuing to liaise with the NEA in order to try and and get confirmation um, as to the exactness of the of our responsibilities and our roles and where the NEA role starts and where it stops uh, and and what councils are actually responsible for. But there is no doubt that if the in the true uh, element of of the legislation itself that if councils were to take on all of these responsibilities, it would require the employment of extra staff. It would certainly require uh, uh, a lot of extra training um, in, in relation to how we deal uh, with, especially with Articles 4 and 5 of, of the other. So just for, for members, it is the, the report is here for information purposes um, and just to, to let members know that uh, we are continuing to consult with the NAEA in, in relation to it. So just the recommendation is that the Council notes the correspondence from the NAEA on Article 28 of the Waste and Contaminated uh, Land, Northern Ireland Order, and notes the updates on the flight tipping protocol in Articles 4 and 5 of the Waste Contaminated Land legislation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. I know this is for noting, but I, I feel as though there's going to be some discussion on this as well. So first of all, I'm going to bring in Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for that update. John, I think I would be fulsome in my praise for the, the position taken by the Council and taken by the officers. And as alluded to, um, it's under 2.4.6, the threat really coming from NIEA about withholding doing their job if the Council doesn't agree with what they're proposing here is something that has to be taken very seriously. Um, that's not how you do the business. That's not how a democracy works. And it's really actually quite concerning that this is how, um, and I know this council has been critical before of NIEA and their many shortcomings, but this is new territory altogether. The proposal before us, as, as John rightly noted, uh, from DARD and NIEA, or from DARE and NIEA, is about passing a much greater responsibility for dealing with more significant and hazardous fly tipping issues and at the same time expecting Council to take it on without the essential additional resources, training and budget. And that's been highlighted quite clearly, not only in this communication and this report and the appendices, but in previous correspondence on this same issue. Uh, I think the points made in 2.3 are, are very apt and they, they bear, I suppose, repeating that officers have reservations on the revised protocol and that it does not address the concept of the polluter pay pays and places a potential greater responsibility on councils to deal with pollution incidents. Incident, incidents. <clears throat> NEA will only be responsible for a very select range of hazardous materials under the revised protocol and the revised proposals significantly increases the threshold for dealing with hazardous material and that councils will have a responsibility for all hazardous waste of a type and volume under 20 cubic metres 
that could be accepted at appropriate authorised uh, council civic amenity sites or waste recycling centres. So I would like to actually propose that this council makes contact with other councils, uh, the other councils across the, uh, across the north, with a view to getting a common approach. I think we have to write to the department making it clear what our concerns are uh, and proposing that more balance and more resource plans should be worked out and agreed in advance of this protocol being signed off. Because I think, as the director rightly alluded to, there's a real shifting of the workload onto the council and there's no uh, recompense to afford the council doing that. So once again, the NIA are failing to live up to their responsibilities. And I think that really has to be opposed and it has to be countered. And the council to date is doing a good job on that. So I'm proposing that we continue that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Emmett. Uh, Councillor Robert Irvine in the Chamber. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I don't disagree with uh, Emmett. Uh, in fact, I would uh, side along with him. But uh, I think what we need is a longer term view. Um, I have harped on, uh, as uh, some other councillors here, particularly Councillor Green, in regard to the lack of responsibility from Forest Service in picking up their uh, responsibilities. It's also been alluded in this chamber that DFI Roads, we take up some, some of their slack and we're getting no revenue stream. This is another way of devolving responsibility from arm's length bodies that sit under certain of uh, stormant departments back to councils without actually giving a proper capital or revenue stream. And if we sit back and take it, more will actually be thrown at councils um, and we will have to pick up the slack. Unfortunately, that means actually charging the ratepayer for it. When this is actually a function of uh, a government department, I agree and I'm happy to second what Emma has said, but I think we need a more radical approach. We need actually to go and lobby directly the uh, executive office uh, along with other councils if they're prepared to come to us and actually say we as councils and particularly this council do not mind picking up some of this work stream but if you're going to give it to us, we need the proper income stream coming from central resources. It is unfair, inequitable and wrong to actually do this by the back door and make the local rate payers pick up a function that should be funded centrally. And I think that has to be put right in front of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister or somebody up at the Executive Office when we get a functioning Executive back or start doing it. So I will second Councillor McAleer's proposal, but my proposal is that we go further. We seek a critical meeting uh, with either by ourselves or with other like-minded councillors, um, a meeting uh, with the Office of the First Minister, the Executive Office, and talk about this function being given to us by the back door and other functions where we should be getting proper revenue streams. I think enough is enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. I'm going to go back now. There's some, some people on Webex, so I'll be bouncing back and forward. So the next speaker is Councillor Dolan Coffee on Webex. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, this 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 threat is not a new threat. Uh, I'm just reviewing correspondence there from Minister Poots uh, from June of 2020 in relation to this exact issue, uh, which I received back from the last time when this uh, was raised as a possibility. And, and it was obvious at that stage, I think uh, some of us had, had discussed the possibility this could incur significant both uh, staffing training uh, and other costs for this council for a function which was newly uh, to be transferred without uh, the ring fenced uh, funding package being in place. Uh, it is undoubtedly a sleight of hand, but the minister's response was to actually claim that we already had uh, discretionary powers under the 1994 and 2003 acts uh, to actually enact, um, uh, you know, to, to, to take on uh, the issue of lower level and less serious fly tipping instance, but I, I thought that those were 
a bit dishonest insofar as uh, just because we have discretionary powers, uh, unless we're resourced to actually utilize them, they're not much use. Um, and the other point really is this threat, uh, which is genuinely quite appalling, that the NIEA, uh, a body I, I have earlier on uh, expressed my severe criticism of, um, has uh, clearly advised uh, that if we do not sign up to this protocol, which is a threat, the inference is that they would not then take on responsibility for any illegal waste over 20 cubic meters. Now, and that includes hazardous waste. So this council could end up picking the, the ending up with the, the tab in theory, if, if this threat is acted upon, uh, for major dumps. And I have to say that it isn't that long ago, and I've repeatedly uh, highlighted this over the, a number of years, there are areas where I have reports of very large dumps in our council area, which I've made to the NIEA. Indeed, I say that I have had someone who was involved in, um, you know, uh, as an employee who would have uh, identified where the waste was dropped by his, uh, uh, by, by people, uh, by people associated with it. And nothing has happened on that. And I, and I, and this is NIE, the same NIEA who's now trying to transfer responsibility. You know, they, 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 despite people telling them where the waste is, and the dump is, they they haven't investigated and they they claim they can't find it. Uh, it's a big enough dump if I, if what I'm hearing is right, but um, you now they're going to make our council pick up the tab if it's not found in time and they transfer this responsibility over to the council. Like this, this is the level of uh, dysfunction, frankly, mm -hmm. that is exhibited in the halls of power in Stormont, uh, where there isn't a function in government and uh, and everything has been now thrown effectively as far as I can see at the councils uh, and NIEA is not fit for purpose. I have absolutely no confidence at all in the organization. And now they're telling our council a threat, basically, that you either sign up to a protocol and take on work, which you have not been funded to do, and you have no capacity or training or skills to do safely, or uh, we, we just wash our hands of you. And that's absolutely uh, unacceptable. I'm sure everyone here would agree that that's unacceptable. But I have to say that was stood over by a minister in an executive only only two years ago. So I would doubt that there's much change coming. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Donald. Uh, now we go to Councillor Tommy Maguire in the chamber. Uh, Governor Margaret Kelly, thank you, Chair. And and just to make members aware that the, the issue of, of uh, extra burden being put on the, the Councils was raised at the last partnership panel. I asked the question myself. Now, again, that, like every other engagement, does not guarantee any success. But just to let members know that the, the question has been raised directly with ministers uh, in that forum. Uh, but if I could just say generally, the, the tone from NAEA is, 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 is disturbing in this instance, instance. But I have to say, in the 11 years back here in the, in the, in the Council, uh, I have to say that all engagements with the NIEA have se appeared to be negative engagement uh, through our planning process, waiting on files and reports through for them. They've delayed uh, planning applications in several instances. Uh, the, any other engagement with them has this negativity about it. And uh, I, I, I agree that we should possibly formulate some sort of a portfolio in conjunction with the other councils indicating and, and preparing it and presenting it to, to Stormont, whoever's there at the time, all the extra burdens that are being put on councils with regard to forestry and, 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 and indeed this one in particular. I'm sure there are other councils have the, the same issues, whereas, uh, as I say, it's good enough to raise the question at the partnership panel. It probably does need a bit more teeth in it and to be presented in sort of uh, some formula so that we can really make a strong case and uh, just as I say, we're all facing into the economic downturn, and I don't know how we're going to finance all the responsibilities we already have. Never mind these extra ones. Thank you. Next, we go to Councillor Josephine Deacon on WebEx. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to John uh, for his very comprehensive report. Chair, I'm sure you will agree that this is very concerning indeed. And uh, did I hear John correctly when he said that some councils had already signed up 
to this revised fly tipping protocol with NIEA. In my opinion, it is very unfair, uh, it is unjust and unreasonable and wholly unacceptable. Uh, Chair, I have spoken in the Council before very strongly against uh, local government being asked uh, to carry out tasks uh, for which it's not properly funded. And in this case, uh, the council does not have the resources, the technical resources, the staffing resources, the financial resources to comply with this rev revised fly tipping protocol. And it's a matter of concern and it's a matter of amazement to me that NIEA cannot acknowledge the very uh, significant and uh, justifiable concerns uh, that councils have in respect uh, of this uh, revised uh, protocol. So my question really is, where was the consultation on this? Uh, what role or what voice was there for uh, local government? Was Solus involved? Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a very serious issue and it will have very severe implications for our rate payers unless we can have it addressed. I think it is a matter that needs to be addressed uh, uh, by the executive. Um, it has a, a totally uh, unreasonable and unjustifiable. And I feel that NIEA really do need to uh, reflect on uh, what their revised protocol would involve for council and go some way towards meeting uh, our very reasonable concerns. So I want to uh, support the comments of uh, other members and uh, the proposal by Councillor McAleer, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Deacon. And I'm going to go first to Councillor Victor Warrington. You haven't been in on this subject. I just want to second the proposal made by Councillor Irvine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Irvine, you've been in before. I'm just going to let you in here briefly. Yeah, I think I've just colleagues here have mentioned we should collaborate maybe with Nilga as well to get a concerted approach. And I think that was probably alluded to by Council McGuire. So that's really within my proposal. And I think Council McGuire has sort of further delved into my proposal. I think we need to actually draw up some form of portfolio right across all uh, areas of work that we do on behalf of all the agencies for which you get no recompense. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Welcome in here, John. Or are you happy enough? Yeah. yeah okay. Right. Um, I'm not seeing any dissent. We've had a number of proposals, and, and John has them noted here. I don't want to repeat them all. Uh, I'm not seeing any dissent, and, and, I, and I get a general view of dissatisfaction from both the Chamber and Webex with the sure. current measures uh, well, that have been taken. Up for a quick comment. Okay, Alex, come on ahead in. It's just in relation to Nilga. There's a Nilga executive meeting on Friday, and I will raise the issue there. Thank you, Councillor Baird. So, Thank uh, you. so I'm taking as all the proposals made around this uh, this change or this protocol as uh, being accepted by the Chamber and Webex. Okay, okay, agreed, everybody. Thank you. Finally, we come on to agenda item eight point two, and again, that's uh, Director John Boyle. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, it's uh, the standard building control and licensing report for the period 24th of June to the 23rd of August. And uh, it's for the Council to note the report on building control and licensing services for that period. Okay. Thank you. I can I have a proposal to note? Councillor Irvine, um, somebody to second that. Uh, Councillor Earl Thompson. Okay, so that's item 8.2. Next, we come on to correspondence. I think so. Sorry, Councillor Maguire. Yes, no, Councillor Maguire. Uh, Carly, thanks again, Chair. And again, uh, I just again, I'll return to the dog figures. I see we had 10 attacks on people in the, in the last period. So uh, that, I believe, has gone up. I think maybe it was four at the last indication. And again, uh, as we have always voiced concern as to the severity of the tax uh, uh, through the chair, John, uh, it's just, uh, as I say, an attack could be a simple matter of an aggressive dog, or it could be a quite severe injury. It's just the, 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 the range of injuries within that 10 attacks, John, if you have any information, please. 
uh, Chair, I have, I have no detailed information on, on the severity of the attacks. One, one thing I will say is that officers on all attacks, whether it be on people, on livestock or on other animals, follow up through the courts. And we actually have been quite successful even in the, in the recent past on convictions in relation to attacks. So uh, we will be, we bring to a quarterly report on the actions which come out of, of all of these attacks and, and we will report that uh, in, in due course on, on the quarterly basis. Thank you, John. Yeah. So next we're on to correspondence. I think some of these items were covered during the, the body of the meeting. So the first one here is the dedicated telephone line. So uh, John News is going to cover that one. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, the members had uh, previously asked uh, that we would uh, write to uh, the Minister uh, requesting that a dedicated uh, telephone line be established for elected representatives to report uh, road-related issues. Uh, and the, uh, the Minister's uh, office has uh, responded, uh, setting out the options that are available to uh, public representatives as well as uh, members of the public. Uh, but there is there's no indication within the response of a dedicated uh, telephone line being established. So that's just a note. Yeah, so um, proposer to note, uh, Councillor Paul Robinson and seconder Victor Warrington. Uh, Councillor Deacon, oh, sorry, you were coming into note. Okay, 9.2, I think. No, so that's we'll go to, Councillor, to Director John Boyle, I think, for that one. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, it's just uh, communication from the Department of Infrastructure in relation to Drumra Car Park and a number of issues which were raised at the previous uh, RNC committee. Um, and uh, the Department have uh, notified us that they are uh, looking at the specific issues in relation to refunds of uh, fixed penalty notices in, in, in relation to it uh, and that uh, they are working along with council officials in, in re reaching a longer term solution uh, for the Mara Avenue car park. And again, proposal to note. Anne Marie Donnelly proposing to note. Uh, Emmett. Sure, no, I'm happy enough to, to note it all right, but I think it's worth just pointing out or highlighting that the letter was sent on the 23rd of June. The response to the 29th of July saying that it was going to take some time. The reality was uh, there wasn't any time wasted when it came to issuing these fixed notices. Uh, so it's really just about keeping the pressure on this one and getting some feedback. We're now into September. Um, you know, what is the turnaround on that? So I don't know if it's something that we sit and wait and see, or is this something that we can maybe follow up now we are into September? Can the council maybe get back to DFA or to uh, Mr Murphy just to clarify at what stage this is at? Um, and even if they haven't got it done at present, what the timeline might be to to get a response on this one? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, Chair, I know I, I was talking to a, an officer from the Department for Infrastructure um, just last week and he indicated that he would be coming back in the near future in relation to a proposal with regard to refunds and, and all of those sorts of issues. So I would, I would expect it within the next number of weeks. Okay. So we'll bring that back under any other business uh, at next month's meeting. And if there's no no advancement at that stage, then we'll, we'll, we'll maybe seek other options. Um, 9.3 is from the National Association of Councillors. Yes, um, Chair, it's uh, in relation to a licensing conference, which is open to all members of the National Association of Councillors, um, which is to be held in, in Nottinghamshire. Um, I suppose uh, it's, it's for members if, if they wish to uh, nominate anyone to attend the conference. Okay, again, well, we just note that, Victor. Oh, sorry, Mary, thank you. Yeah, um, propose to note, Chair, and swiftly move on from that one. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Victor. That one's safely filed away. And uh, did we cover that fourth one on earlier in the meeting? The DFI one? Correspondence from DFI roads. Uh, that's yeah. been covered, so we can move on from that. Uh, there's no other correspondence. Okay, I've had... Um, on to any other business. I had a few things of any other business. I have one of my own as well. And and as the, I'm the chair, I'll throw mine in first. <laughs> this is my prerogative. Um those of you that follow 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 rallying, um 
Closely will know that there's two young men from Fermanagh who are in the, the final round of the Junior World Rally Championship. That's John Armstrong and Brian Howey. Uh, they drive a Ford car. Uh, one, one door has a Union Jack on it and the other has a tricolour on it. And that's no reflection on the two young men. Uh, one of them lives a few fields away from me and the other young lad I've known for quite a few years as well. And this is the last round. They're a point behind. They're doing the rackies today and the rallying will be going into the weekend. So uh, I want to wish them, firstly, a safe day at, uh, or safe weekend and that they come back to, to Northern Ireland safely and wish them the best of good luck. If they win or if the odds go right and they get in front of all the other people, they will come back here as the junior world champions. And, and that's a big feat, especially in Greece. Greece, for anybody who follows rallying, the Greek roads are the worst in the world to rally on. So I'm wishing them all the best in that there. And I'm sure all my fellow councillors will agree to wish them their best. Okay. Uh, the next was uh, Councillor Tommy Maguire had indicated a matter, but and there any other business? Sorry, Tommy. John, thanks, John. It's in, uh, I received an email in the in the recent past, and I have forwarded to the chief executive and indeed to the chair too. And it's in relation to the the removal of daycare for people with learning difficulties. Uh, the e email is comprehensive and full of the detail. But uh, uh, the reason for the OB is to ask that this item be placed on the agenda for the uh, health subcommittee. As I say, the chief executive was aware of the detail of the email, and I can make it available if. No, I, think, I don't think you have to. I think we've all received that email. Oh, did uh, everyone receive it? Well, that's yeah. even, even better. That, I wasn't that, Paul? aware that everyone had. So Paul's okay. signing that, so we make sure that's put on the agenda for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew, you've, uh, Matthew, Councillor Matthew Bell, uh, your matter has been resolved, so you don't need to bring it up. Uh, that's correct, Chair. I got a response from TransLink today, so I'm happy enough. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matthew. So... That's us included any other business. Uh, Paul's matter was covered earlier on in the meeting. Um, so now we're at, uh, we need to go into confidential. So that's Anthony Feely and Councillor Emmett McAleer. Councillor Anthony Feely and Councillor Emmett McAleer proposing and second. Sorry, Emmett. Sorry, Chair, just very briefly, and it wasn't to, to do with the confidential business. It was in relation to the proposal raised by Councillor Maguire. I was just wondering if he would consider including, there's an issue surrounding um, the provision of uh, transport to and from schools in relation to SEN students as well, also provided by EA. So possibly if that could be included in his proposal, I would appreciate it. Uh, I think I think that needs to go to. I'm going to allow you to raise that, Emmett, under any other business, but I think that has to go to the Department of Ag of Education. But I think it's something that probably needs to be done sooner rather than later. So have we a seconder then for that, uh, Councillor Adam Gallon? Uh, Victor. Yeah, well, uh, there. I know there's a problem across the whole province about uh, children with uh, special needs. Um, I, I'm actually friends with a girl on social media and she uh, voiced her problems the other day and um, I communicated with her and, and I got one of our councillors in the area to get it on board but I've seen just another one today um, on social media as well in the Belfast area so it seems to be a problem across the province um, where there has been a breakdown uh, in communications uh, between uh, EA and uh, private taxi companies who do a lot of the runs. So I'm not sure if it's an ongoing problem that's been in the process of being resolved or whether uh, certainly it can be brought up with the health committee, but as, as, as somebody said, it's not really relevant, but it can be still brought up. Thank you, Victor. I think it's one of them things, uh, if we can bring any pressure to bear to get them to speed up the process, it would be a help. Sorry, I'm going to let you in briefly, Amit, here. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and I will be very brief on this. If you're permitting to me to raise it under any other business, it would be probably more apt that it's aimed at the EA, um, as Councillor Warrington quite rightly says, and it's really to clarify, I suppose, the impact that it's having on, on children and families within, primarily within the Fermanagh and Oma District Council area, because this was an issue last year, 
and unfortunately it seems to be one that's raising its head again. So I appreciate that you're letting it back in and that it seems to have cross party support. Thank you. Okay, Chief. thank you. And you're happy again seconding that, Adam? Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, now we can move on. And it was proposed by Councillor Anthony Feely and seconded by Adam to go into confidential, wasn't it? Was that right? No. Oh, sorry, Emmett. It wasn't confidential. He wasn't. Okay. And well, then you were next. So, so Councillor Anthony Feely has proposed we went to confidential. So, IT, if you can give me a wave when.
usual signal. Okay, that's I say, uh, and uh, go to Officer John News to uh, summarise the uh, the part of the meeting that was in confidential. Uh, thank you, Chair. During uh, confidential business, members uh, considered and approved uh, confidential minutes uh, from the uh, last meeting of the uh, Environmental Services Committee on the, the 5th of July and uh, any matters arising, and uh, also considered and approved uh, a confidential paper in respect of estate matters and leased land uh, within the Fermanagh Noma District Council uh, area. Thank you. Can I have a proposer? Councillor Adam Gannon, seconded by Councillor Tommy McGuire. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we've covered quite a, a bit of business and we've had some robust be debates tonight. So it's, it's quite a sombre note we're going home, but uh, safe home, everybody.